Good morning, everyone. My name is Elena Rinaldi, and I am part of the press office of ICMA, our student association affiliated with the University of Bologna. ICMA was born with the aim of offering students and the youth in a more general sense, opportunities of information, knowledge, and in-depth analysis of the international events that surrounds us, raising awareness on how they influence our lives. Our goal is to go beyond universities' disciplines and to create occasions to optimistically look at change and innovation. That's why this year we have decided to build the second edition of the ICMA Summit of International Relations around three main pillars, inequalities, sustainability, and digitalization. These represent the three major challenges that are currently shaping our present and that will inevitably shape our future. Challenges that need to be understood, analyzed, and properly addressed. Today, we're going to dig deeper into the inequality pillar. In particular, we're going to discuss how rural poverty is affected by the food market, by the food distribution and consumption systems. We will look at how the relationship between food security and rural poverty has been studied up to now, with a special focus on rural communities, which are heavily affected of such communities is the first fundamental step towards a more ethical, sustainable, and inclusive approach to buying and consuming food. We will not only investigate how these inequalities are created, but also which potential solutions could be implemented to tackle them and what actions shall be taken by individuals, consumers, and policymakers. We're going to learn all about these important issues with our exceptional speaker, Dr. Maximo Torero Cullen, Chief Economist of the Food and Agriculture Organization FAO since 2019. Thank you, Professor Vituari, for your availability and for bringing your expertise. Finally, I would like to remind our participants that, we can, that they can ask questions to the speaker through the platform Slido, which you can easily access by scanning the QRL code of this slide or by going to the website slido.com and typing in the code displayed on the slide, which is 149977. So without further ado, I wish everyone a good conference and I leave the floor to Professor Vituari. Thank you. Thank you and good morning to everybody. And first of all, thanks for ICMA for being organized this uh, extremely interesting and uh, important uh, event. So today we will discuss about uh, food security, rural poverty, and uh, inequalities and food system sustainability that are crucial topics uh, in the agenda of many national and uh, international organizations. And uh, we will have the pleasure to do so and to discuss these uh, challenges with uh, Mac, uh, Dr. Maximo Torero. Dr. Uh, Maximo Torero is uh, uh, currently the chief economist uh, of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. And before joining uh, uh, FAO, he was uh, uh, also the lead of the World Bank uh, Executive uh, Director uh, for Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, Paraguay, and uh, Uruguay. And during his uh, extensive international career, he uh, also served for the uh, International Food Policy Research uh, Institute. And uh, before joining international organizations, he received uh, a master and a PhD from the University uh, of California in the USA. And uh, he's continuing his uh, academic career uh, since uh, he is also professor on leave at uh, the University of Pacific. Uh, in Lima, Peru, and uh, at the University of Bonn in Germany. Uh, he's uh, covering uh, a wide uh, array of different research uh, interests, encompassing poverty, inequalities, uh, how geography and assets, uh, both public and private, uh, can explain uh, poverty, 
is interested in how technology can support the welfare of households and small farmers. And uh, today he will uh, introduce us uh, uh, to his work uh, and his vision with uh, a speech on uh, rural poverty and uh, inequalities and how rural poverty and inequalities uh, are affected by the food market. So I don't want to keep uh, any additional time and uh, I will leave the floor to Dr. Torero. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Vituari, and thank you very much, Eleonora. It's a pleasure for me to, to be here. Let me, let me start by sharing my screen uh, and explain a little bit how I'm going to do this presentation today. Uh, so what we're going to do is going through uh, the agri-food systems and how the relationship between agri-food systems and rural poverty. This is a central topic because when we talk today of, of reconstruction, when we talk today of building back better, we don't mention too much rural areas. We don't mention too much agriculture. And, and I believe that's a big mistake. And, and you will see through my presentation why the importance of looking at both at the same time. Uh, today, agriculture needs to be transformed and, and digital technologies, ubiquity, portability, and mobility everywhere could help enormously to do this. But we need to first understand the challenges faced and how we can reduce uh, those, those inequalities. So let me start by motivating the importance of the topic. Uh, in sustainable agri-food systems development, and I will explain why exactly I mean by agri-food systems development. Uh, sustainability is examined holistically. In order to be sustainable, the development of the agri-food system needs to generate positive value along three dimensions, economic, social, and environmental. Now, poverty reduction and food security and nutrition concerns are at the center of the agri-food system transformation agenda. The COVID 19 pandemic pushed additional 119 million people to 124 million people into extreme poverty. So essentially, we are losing more than a decade of reduction in extreme poverty. And this also may, may increase the number of people undernourished between 83 to 132 million people. Now, even before COVID 19, in 2019, when we launched SOFI 2020, Around 2 billion people did not have access to safe, nutritious, and sufficient food, and 3 billion people couldn't afford uh, healthy diets. The important thing is to understand is that 80%, and let me repeat, 80% of the extreme poor live in rural areas, and 76% of the rural extreme poor workers work in agriculture. So if we don't do the linkage between agriculture and rural areas, uh, we are not going to resolve the problem. And that's the major point that I want to make today. And this is, of course, linked to inequalities. The employment generated by the agri-food system goes beyond agriculture itself and estimates around 4.5 billion people globally depending on agri-food systems and livelihoods. In West Africa, the agri-food system accounts for 66% of total employment. Since 1995, international trade in food and agriculture has more than doubled. And today, about one third of global agriculture and food exports are traded within global value chains. And to be a global value chain, just that the concept is clear, is when you move commodities from three borders. So as long as a commodity in a value chain transpasses three borders, it's called a global value chain. But smallholders in this global value chain world still face structural constraints on accessing markets, and again, brings the concept of inequality. For women, these constraints are even higher. The stringent requirements in modern food value chains could further isolate farmers from the market mechanisms. So agri-food systems contribute to more than a third of global greenhouse gas emissions at the same time. So there is a cost also associated to the environment of these agri-food systems. 27% or more are greenhouse gas emissions coming from agriculture. So if we are going to refer to a Build Back Better greener, the greener implies by itself that we need to touch the agricultural sector. But up to now, if you hear what is being talked, they don't talk about the agricultural sector, and that's a big mistake. Inclusive agri-food system transformation, therefore, is key for poverty alleviation, promoting a sustainable development and realizing human rights. So to be inclusive, agri-food system transformation will require explicit incorporation of inclusion aims into policy programs and investments. Now, let me explain what we mean by agri-food systems so that we have very clear concepts from the beginning. The green area shaded in this graph refers to the agricultural sector, so what is produced in agriculture. The orange refers to what we call food, food systems. In agriculture, we produce non-food products and food products. The food products is what you eat today, so cereals, high-value commodities, fish, vegetables, fruits. The 
non-food products are related to fibers, biofuels, forestry, which are not to eat. Only a part of forestry, which is the fruits, uh, are, are, are part of food. So that non-food products that are developed through the agricultural system are also important because they create income to these rural people and therefore they can access to food. But they are not part of the food system. They are indirectly part because it allows them to access to food. But then there is this little piece which we call non-agri-food products. They are part of the food system, but they don't come from agriculture. And these are, for example, genetic engineering foods and synthetic foods. This is starting to get significant importance and it will affect the market structure of the food system. And that's an area that we have done a little and we have to keep working on it because it's growing. So again, the agri-food systems incorporate both. That's the holistic view that we as FAO look at. Now, of course, then you have to relate this agri-food sector with the different sectors, health, environment, and so on, and look at the trade-offs and synergies. And that's exactly uh, what we are trying uh, to do. So the agri-food system is composed of subsystems, for example, the farming system, the waste management system, the input supply systems, and interacts with other key systems like the energy system, the trade system, the health system. A sustainable agri-food system is an agri-food system that delivers food security and nutrition for all in such a way that economic, social, and environmental basis to generate food security and nutrition for future generations are not compromised. This means that it is profitable throughout the economic sustainability. It is broad-based benefits for society, that's the social sustainability, and it has a positive or a neutral impact on nature, environment, and environmental sustainability. So economic sustainability, social sustainability, and environmental sustainability in interrelation with other systems like the energy, the trade system, and the health system. Now, inequalities, sorry about that. Uh, the agri-food system also impact on poverty and inequalities. Inequalities in the access to agricultural land. Land is the basis for food production, enable access to key productive resources such as water, animal feed, and such, it is central factor for wealth accumulation, power, and influence in society. Recent evidence has pointed to the highly unequal distribution of growing concentration of land at the global level. And despite the small farms of two hectares or less represent 84% of total farms in the world, they only operate only 12% of the total agricultural land. In contrast, the largest 1% of farms, those 50 hectares or more, operate more than 70% of the total farmland and the four of the production. And again, we need to be careful because we talk a lot about family farming, but family farming can be large, medium, and small. It's different to smallholders. Agricultural low wage and poor working conditions is also central. The rural poor in low and middle income countries often engage in informal, low productivity employment and have limited access to decent work. Processes of economic transformations has given little priority to policies and regulations to foster a transformation from informal to formal work with the result of a high rate of informality. Third, the modernization of the agri-food value chains and small scale producers shown that power has substantially shifted in the globalized agri-food systems in favor of global buyers against producers, in part due to the diminished government capacities following structural adjustments and the inflow of agri-food multinationals into the, produ into the producing countries. Quality and price-based competition has soared also in the domestic food markets of developing countries with imports of everything offering products often cheaper and of a higher quality than those from domestic production, particularly in Africa. Farm size is limiting the small scale producers' participation in the modern food market and global value chains because of the sustainable fixed costs that they have to face. What we know is that 36 percent of the value of food of, of the value of food at global level is produced by smallholders. It's again only 36 percent. In high income countries and in Latin America, characterized by a higher presence of large farms, the share is much lower. While in China, most of the value of production is generated by smallholders, but this is also changing the structural in China. Corporate farming is becoming central in China. While the smallholder sector still plays an important role in feeding the world, the trend suggests an increasing role of larger farms. Hence, ensuring market participation by smallholder farmers, particularly in regions where most farmers are constituted by them, will be important for poverty eradication, food security, and for fostering process of economic development in the years to come. Global agricultural value chains are also growing and can be driven mainly by globally traded commodities such as bananas, avocados, 
avocados, coffee, sugar, and, or others. Global demand of these items is crucial for socioeconomic growth and development. However, the same demand can generate adverse impact on sourcing communities and bring about challenges such as child labor, forced labor, and even food insecurity in cases of overcropping for commodity exports. Recently, several governments have introduced legislation to mitigate the, effect, the, the negative adverse effects of environmental and social impacts of agricultural supply chains by requiring companies to establish mandatory risk-based due diligence systems, all of which plays a key role in poverty reduction. And finally, a big trade-off is the effect on climate change and the effect on natural resources. Extreme weather events disproportionately affect the rural poor, as the majority depend on agricultural activities based on natural resources and a favorable and predictable climate. Extreme weather and other rural shocks also affect health, access to water, and food security, and lead to loss in already small endowments by damaging infrastructure and animal shocks, particularly fish, and the role in natural resources and ecosystems. So climate change will likely disproportionately affect least developed countries, with sub-Saharan Africa being the particular concern. Climate change poses enormous challenges for small-scale farming farmers, forest-dependent people, and affects fisheries and fishing communities who are directly exposed to coastal erosion, ocean acidification, and floods. The rural poor also face more difficulty in adapting to climate change due to limited investment capacity to diversify or adopt climate resistant technologies. Trade-offs between conserving natural resources and poverty eradication require more attention, and we need to measure them. And that's the effort we are doing in the Food System Summit. We are modeling the magnitude of the trade-offs and synergies. Climate action calls for major changes in agricultural food systems, but policies that could be implemented may have negative implications for the poor that need to be addressed. They will both affect the livelihoods of the rural poor who depend on agriculture and food systems as well as prices of food that they consume. So this is the situation we are facing, and that's why the importance of the interrelationship between rural inequalities, poverty, and agricultural systems. Now, what is, the, what is the, the photograph and where we are and where we need to be? We are at a critical moment in time. We are starting uh, to see a convergence of factors that if ignored threaten to prevent us from ending global hunger and malnutrition in all its forms. Our agri-food systems are not delivering the food security and nutrition outcomes we want to achieve. That does not mean at all that historically there has been an improvement, but today with the challenges we have of these years, we are not going to comply them. We are not on track to be able to achieve them. At the same time, our agri-food systems were suffering from pollution are buffering from dangerous feedback loops that are harmful to our health, economy, and planet that's threatening future food security and nutrition. There are several overarching key drivers and mega trends that have shaped our agri-food system. Population dynamics and urbanization. There is a huge movement towards urban areas. Climate change, as I have mentioned before. Economic growth and structural transformation and macroeconomic stability. Cross-country interdependencies that has been as clear as ever with COVID-19, how interdependent we are across the different countries. Big data generation, control and use and ownership, which is also affecting the way we operate. Geopolitical instability and increasing impacts of conflict, which is one of the major reasons of the food crisis countries we have today. And finally, uncertainties. When we talk about uncertainty, conceptually, it's different to risk. When you talk about risk, it's something that you can predict the damage. You can predict the distribution probability of the damage. When you talk about uncertainty, you cannot. You don't know the loss function attached to uncertainty. And that makes it a lot more complex. And COVID-19 at the beginning was that. Even today, we still don't know the probability distribution of the damage behind. So you cannot ensure uncertainties. You can ensure risk, like our car insurance. So we need to do things differently than in the past. And our agri-food systems need to be transformed. That's clear. And people complain why we say transformation, because we really need a radical change. If not, we are not going to achieve what we are aiming to achieve. So let me tell you and show you the photograph today of where we are. It is evident that our agri-food systems are failing us. The number of hungry people in the world has increased in the last six years in a row. It increased by 10 million in 2019 and nearly 60 million in the last five years before that. COVID-19 pandemic and the measures to contain continue to deliver severe blow. By the end of 2020, it's estimated that COVID-19 added around up to 132 million to the number of hungry people in the world. Child stunting remains an acceptable high, 
and overweight and obesity continues to increase in rich and poor countries alike. The number of people living with obesity exceeded that of people in Hungary in 2012. And more than 3 billion people, as I previously mentioned in the world, cannot afford even the cheapest healthy diet. At the same time, current consumption patterns and our agri-food system that support these are also leading to significant environmental impacts. They are a contributor to high food waste and loss, 14% losses, according to FAO, food index, loss food index, and 17% waste, according to the latest number of UNEP. We also are creating air pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, loss of biodiversity, and a growing source of inequality. Our food systems are generating severe human, economic, and environmental costs that run into the trillions of dollars, and we need to look at them very carefully. Now, where do we need to be by 2030? And people don't talk too much about this, but this is where we need to be. First, undernourishment has to be reduced everywhere to a maximum of 5% if we want to achieve the SDG. Healthy diets have to be affordable for all. So these 3 billion people, one third of our population in 2030, has to have access to the cheapest healthy diet. Overweight has to be reduced everywhere to levels of 15%, similar to what it was in the 1980s. Obesity needs to be reduced to no more than 5% in any country. Standing among children need to significantly improve, which will recover the lost decade in rural poverty. Inequalities need to be reduced substantially if we want to sustain our reduction of rural poverty. And let me stop a minute here. We don't know and we don't have good experiences of policies targeted to reduce inequalities. Although technically we know them, but they are very difficult to implement politically like tax reforms, for example. Look what is happening right now in the US and the tax reform that the President Biden wants to implement as an example. Now, but if we don't reduce those inequalities, which with COVID-19 has exacerbated, there is no way, there is no way we're going to move out of poverty sustainably. And therefore we could resolve the problem for a short period of time, but we won't resolve it whenever there is another shock, people will go back to extreme poverty like what we are facing today. So inequality is a central necessary condition to be able to achieve SDG 1 and SDG 2. That's why we are targeting the three SDGs now. FAO used to target SDG 2, now we target SDG 1, 2, and 10. Finally, the planet, we need to achieve a number of neutralities in carbon, in land degradation, increase the efficiency in the use of water for agriculture, and we need to hit the Paris Agreement target of reducing greenhouse gas emissions to limit global climate warming between 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius. So the challenge is huge. It's not simple, but we need to be realistic. We need to know where we are going and where we want to go. Now, to get where we need in 2030, we must understand the challenges facing us through an agri-food system lens and act holistically, as I mentioned before. This requires that we recognize the interconnectedness and compound economic, social, and environmental impacts of our agri-food system. From a policy perspective, this has important implications, providing crucial guidance on how to prioritize our actions and investments. We also need to look for synergies and to understand and measure the trade-offs. If you want to implement a policy, every policy you implement will have a trade-off. The goal is to identify them so that we can opt for the policies that operate under the minimum trade-offs. And that by knowing them, we can also put complementary policies that will minimize those. It's like a trade reform. No? When you do trade and access to trade, there will be winners and losers. The trade-offs are the losers. We have to put policies to protect those losers. That doesn't not mean that we have to stop trade because of that. On the contrary, we should pursue trade and create the winners, but we need to compensate the losers so that they also benefit from this transformation. For example, greening of food systems offers several win-win and even triple win solutions for ending hunger and tracking climate change. There is an array of portfolios of solutions that can reduce carbon footprint, ensure environmental sustainability, and at the same time tackle hunger, food insecurity, malnutrition by ensuring affordable healthy diets for all. Moreover, policy and solutions can be designed to be an engine of economic recovery, creating viable jobs and sustainable livelihoods, but importantly, readdressing inequalities. We also need to manage the trade-offs. So for example, some low and lower middle income countries may need to increase their carbon footprints in order to meet the dietary needs of their populations, particularly to prevent malnutrition. 
That does not mean that they shouldn't do it. That means that other countries, because again, remember, greenhouse gas emissions is affecting a global public good. It's affecting the world. It's not affecting one specific country. So we need to put globally policies to compensate for that need that these developing countries need because they need to increase their footprint, no matter how efficient they are in how they produce. So holistic agri-food system solutions will be context specific and much needs to be done to identify this, but it's critical that we begin to do so and to do it at a scale. Now, if we are going to get where we need to be in 2030, we must focus on transforming also our agri-food systems. They are not only the largest economic system measured in terms of employment, 4.5 billion, livelihoods, planetary impact, but poverty and inequality are endemic in our agri-food systems. If our agri-food systems are performed sustainably and inclusively to deliver the food security and nutrition outcomes we need, they can become a powerful force contributing to ending hunger, malnutrition in all its forms in the world. We are facing immense challenges today. More than 30% of the total global land is degraded. More than 20% of the world acquires are overexploited. And our agrodiversity is under threat. There are circular interconnected impacts across the agri-food systems and other systems, including environmental and health systems. This includes more virulent outbreaks of plant and animal pests and diseases. And COVID-19 and other diseases are rooted in the environmental change. Our agri-food systems are not only victims in this interconnected and circular loop, but our agri-food systems also are generators of degradation of natural resources and health, including pandemics and our diseases. Our food systems, agri-food systems, are contributing to global greenhouse gas emissions. This is one of the many challenges of the food systems today. Agriculture uses about 40% of the Earth's land but along with energy and transportation, it contributes significantly to the global greenhouse gas emissions. Not only livestock and fisheries, but also the way we produce crops using fertilizers. Many different aspects of the food systems are contributing to the global greenhouse gas emissions and contributing to the climate disruptions, which we see all around. But we must look at it more in detail to find out the potential subsectors to work with and how it imp to improve it. Therefore, a piecemeal approach approach has proven unable to address the interconnected na nature of this challenge. We must urgently work holistically across sectors to transform the agri-food system to become a positive force, a force that protects our planet, our health, and ensures food security and nutrition. And this graph shows the decomposition of how these global emissions are coming from the agricultural sector. So 18% from the supply chain, 31% from livestock and fisheries, crop produ production 27%, and land use 24%. A holistic approach is the only way we can systematically reduce this. It's not just an issue of livestock. It's an issue of all the different sectors. At the same time, biodiversity and ecosystem services are essential for our food security and nutrition through sustainable agriculture, forestry, and fisheries, where they generate multiple livelihood benefits. Biodiversity provides uh, regulating and supporting ecosystem services for agricultural production. Over half of the world's GDP is moderately or highly dependent on nature, such as pollination, water quality, and natural materials with agriculture and food and beverages being two of the largest industries among those most dependent. 75% of the Earth's land surface is significantly altered. More than 30% of the world land area is moderately to heavily degraded. 66% of the ocean area is experiencing multiple impacts from people including from fisheries, pollution, and chemical changes and, and, and acidification. Over 85% of wetland area has been lost. The species extinction rates have increased tens to hundreds of times. Nearly a third of fish stocks are overfished. 26% of local breeds of livestock are at the risk of extinction. And 24% of nearly 4,000 wild food species are decreasing in abundance. Now, Under this context, and under, under the restrictions, I'm, apologies, I'm having a, a problem with, with my drive. Sorry, a second. Give me a second, please, that I have to, to fix. Of course, no problem. All right. Yes, a minute.
keep apologies, but for some reason, my, my draft, my hard drive. It's okay. In the meantime, I would like to remind our participants that if they want to ask questions to our speaker, they can access the Slido platform uh, by scanning the QRL that we uh, showed before or by going to the website slado.com and inserting the code 149977. Yes, put where we were. Okay, I hope you can see it again. And apologies for that. But for some reason that I don't understand, my hard drive life. So, okay, so let me, let me go back and, and sorry for, for this problem. Uh, so essentially the, the issue now is what we can do and how we can transform this, this food system. Uh, and the capacity of, of the agri-food system to meet its objective of food security, nutrition and environmental sustainability depends on the ability of farmers and consumers to access resources and manage risk and uncertainty. This is intrinsically linked to how resources are distributed in a society. Increasing the level of poverty caused by the current pandemic, climate change, and other major shocks will force vulnerable groups without protection to rely on negative coping strategies. These include selling productive assets, reducing expenditures on education and health, and opting for less nutritious diets. And this is what we are going and are already observing because of COVID-19. These actions have had long-lasting effects uh, on welfare and vulnerable populations. Just imagine. Kids are not going to school. Kids are not getting the regular vaccinations. Uh, Families are having less access to income. Most of the developing economies are informal. And they don't have a social security like we have in, in developed countries. When in Italy, we lose our job, we get unemployment insurance. Informal economy doesn't have unemployment insurance. So how these people are subsisting, how they are adjusting their diet patterns. So strong social and economic inequalities created by an economic system that does not meet people's basic needs as well as development aspirations and where a sense of unfairness persists will continue to create political instability and insecurity and sometimes escalate violence. Persistent inequalities in access to resources and social protection as well as existing inequalities and discrimination related to gender and ethnic continue to limit human capital formation and productive capacity of the populations that are at the forefront of the food systems. Now, we believe that if, if we reduce these inequalities in access to services and infrastructure, inequalities in access to potential social protection programs and gender, as I mentioned before, and indigenous inequalities, we will be getting closer to improve and get to this transformation. But one of the points which is essential when we talk about this transformation is resilience. And again, resilience is a complex concept. Uh, it has two core components. Some people refer to three. The first one is reduce the chops, of course, but that's complex. But let's focus on the ones we can easily control or control at least. One is to minimize risks, vulnerabilities. And the second one is to cope with risks when they occur. Now, what it means to minimize risk? It means that we need to have and invest in early warning systems. It means that we need to be able to have more predictive power to alert countries and households before the event happens. It means that we have to follow a One Health approach, and this is also linked to reducing the number of risks, as promoted by FAO, OIE, and WHO, because it has enormous potential to prevent the emergence of new zoonotic reservoirs from the current COVID-19 pandemic. And finally, it means that we need to increase access to agricultural insurance when it's a risk. No? And that means combining it with index-based insurance, traditional insurance, and access to finance. We need to find solutions that are adopted and picked up by, by small and the poorest. To cope with the risk, the second component, it means that we need to link this to recovery plans. And this is where we need a movement to make this change, because recovery plans are not linked to this rural development and to agriculture today. First is to focus on social protection mechanisms to support access to food for the poorest. Second is to align incentives and redirect subsidies of farm support from staples to high value commodities. 
Because if we're going to talk about healthy diets, we need to change. Today, we subsidize the staple commodities, but we refer that we need to increase access to healthy diets. And 3 billion people don't have access to those healthy diets. So why we keep the structure of subsidies we have today? It doesn't make too much sense. Use trade to boost farmers' productivity and income, link value chains infrastructure initiatives to financial systems, and use technology wisely to support investments and digital innovations. Those are the core for now, the concept of, of agri-food system resilience is complex. Normally, when we talk about resilience, we have been referring to the household. Most of the work is how we make the household resilient. But it's different to make a system resilient. And as I mentioned, our system is complex. So we need to answer three questions. Resilience to what? Resilience of what? And resilience for what? For the first question is shocks and stressors, biophysical, environmental, and legal. Chosen stressors can be different, and we need to look at all of them. The second component represents how we can, of course, in the context of the climatic conditions that we are in the macro environment we are and in institutions we are, how we can create that resilience for what. And then we can start thinking on what to increase the resilience. And again, we have to look at the agricultural producers as part of the agri-food firms, we have to look at the consumers, but we have to look at the food supply chains and food transportation network. And this, of course, is related to international trade, to imports and exports. So it is important that our system looks at all these elements, because then we will understand for what we are doing this. If we look at the agricultural producers and agri-food systems, we are looking to work with the business success and livelihoods so they keep their profit, their investments, and their innovation. If we are looking at the consumers, we want to improve food security and nutrition, especially for vulnerable households. And if we want to look at the, at the chain and the transportation network, we need to have a stable, continuous flow of sufficient, accessible, and nutrition foods in a sustainable manner. Let's recall March 2020. In March 2020, we didn't have a problem of food availability. The food was there. The major problem that we had was logistics how to move the food. Because of the lockdowns, the logistical network was completely compromised. Not only within countries and regions, but also between countries. Vessels couldn't move from one port to the other. And that was the major concern. And we were not ready for that, incredibly. Those are the things that alert us of what is a system. No? It was not only production. It was not only the, the, the demand of the people. They have access at that point in time. But it was also this logistical part, part of the value chain. And therefore, that helped us to understand how a country is resilient or not, how a system is resilient or not. And to be honest, agriculture has shown to be resilient. If you look today at the food import bill, the food import bill has only a small decline during COVID-19, but now and before, several months ago already, is the same, has not changed with respect to the previous year, which tell us how resilient our system was. This figure represents a preview of the type of information that we will be providing in the national level for 140 countries, focusing on the direct sourcing of flexibility and economic access. For the purpose of, of, this, full, of this figure, four countries are selected from the database. Rather than provided the name of this, given the preliminary nature of the data, three of them are categorized by their situation relative to agri-food trade. And, and, and one is a least developed country, LDC, a landlocked developing country, LLDC. The data in the figure is not representative of the broader category. It refers to since there is considerable variation within each category, depending on the country. The intention is just to showcase the diversity across different types of countries in their approach to sin and nutritious diet and their success in ensuring economic access to food. The dietary source flexibility indicator that composes the contribution of diversity in agricultural production, imports, exports, and buffer stocks in determining a country capacity to absorb the shock to its agri-food systems in terms of availability of nutritious food for consumers. This is done for calories, proteins, and quantity of fruits and vegetables. A dietary 
a dietary source in flexibility value above 1.5 indicates a good capacity to absorb the shock in supply, while a value of one is worrisome and represents a vulnerability of the agri-food system to that supply shock. The value of the indicator is, is based exclusively on the sourcing of diversity of agricultural products in the national agri-food system. By the way of this indicator, policymakers can view how the agri-food system's capacity to absorb the shock relies on domestic production, import option of fallback on buffer stocks or redirection exports to the domestic market. A key element of the indicator is trade connectivity in terms of imports, which can provide additional pathways to make up to for a shortfall in supply, thus having many trading partners increase the absorb the shock. And you can see here how different countries will behave differently. Also, we have the dietary uh, sourcing flexibility of proteins, sourcing flexibility for kilograms of fruits, and economic buffering capacity. So how much in the economic buffering capacity show the share of the population that has enough of an income buffer to afford a nutrition adequate diet in the presence of a disruption in the purchasing power. And as can show in the last figure, which is all the gray bars, it varies widely across countries. Less than 10% of the LDCs and LLDC countries population has enough of an economic buffer, while this case for over 75% in two two way trade country and the large net importer. So the difference between the LLDC and the LDC and the other large exporting and importing countries is huge. And that brings again the overall picture of how important it is to create these new indicators to be able to measure how we are doing in terms of resilience. And that's where the work we are trying to do and trying to understand better what a resilience in the food system is. Now, where we think the transformation should go and where we need to accelerate. We believe that there are four accelerators, four. Data, new data, real-time data, technology based on science, science-driven technology, innovation, and complements. What is complements? Complement is something that we normally mislead and don't take into consideration. And it's the key element to assure that all these other accelerators, innovation, data, and technology, which can move very fast and today, they are moving very fast, are inclusive, and that's linked to inequalities. Why? Because it brings governance, institutions, and human capital. Those are three core elements. We can see it in the cellular digital form telephones, the digital gap. There is a huge digital gap. So if I want to be inclusive, I have to have regulatory agencies, institutions in place to minimize the differences and to increase competition so that everybody can have access. So again, data, technology, innovation, and the complements. Now, it could be that the complements will make the acceleration a little bit slower. But in the medium, it will make it faster and sustainable. And that's what we are aiming to. Now, looking at the early warning systems, we're trying to bring together, because honestly speaking, I don't know in the world right now any system of early warning that have real predictive power. Several years ago, I was part of one that we tried to do for volatility of prices. That was in the G20 of Paris. And it's a model that predicts you 30 days before the level of volatility. But there is not too much. But what there is, is a lot of different elements or core, what I call little silos, that look at a specific elements. No? So we have the FAO use, we have the IME system, we have Empresai, we have the WAPOR for water stress, and so on and so forth. What we need to do and what we are doing now and we hope to launch it by the end of the year is a situation room, which will be an early warning system for the world, which will have some predictive power. I hope we are able to do it, but that's our aim, that we can alert countries in different dimensions of where they are and how they could be and which is linked to how to cope with the risk is how we can prioritize what we do. Targeting and effectiveness of interventions are central today because the budget constraint that we have is terrible. So using the marginal cost curve approach, we assess two interventions to identify the least cost investment options with the highest potential for reducing undernourishment. And we can do the same for poverty. Information about interventions was drawn from the best practice evidence-based literature, including modeling studies and impact assessments. And what we concluded that 
500 million people out of hunger and malnutrition by 2030, governments will need to increase their investments by about 14 billion per annum over the coming 10 years. That is, in addition to what they and governments of low and middle income countries are already investing. So it's not just new 14 billion, but it's in addition to what countries are already investing. This is roughly equivalent to doubling of the current G7 development assistance for agriculture, food security and rural agricultural research and development, agriculture extension services, digital agriculture information systems, small scale irrigation expansion in Africa, female literacy, and so up of existing social protection programs. Clearly, this portfolio is hunger reducing in sustainable ways, as most of the interventions are also income enhancing and empowering, not just short term hunger reducing. Now, ending hunger under a scenario of adverse trends will obviously require larger additional investments, which are what we are facing today. We assess the cost of such a scenario that factors in both continuation of the limited progress in hunger reduction, as observed in the past five years, as I mentioned before, plus what COVID-19 is bringing together. And if we want to do that, we need to lift around 400, 840 to 909 million people out of undernourishment by 2030. And to be able to achieve that, we need higher investments than to lift 500 million people out of, of, of hunger. And these higher investments are about 39 to 50 billion per annum over the 10 years until 2030. That is in addition to what governments are currently already investing. In this case, both donor and development countries will have a beer of fair or financial burden. So here is the core element, how we use these this recovery funds to do that, and how also we attract private sector resources to be able to achieve that. Now, what we have been observing because of the situation today is a huge increase in the numbers that have social protection. Of course, this has to be found have shifted and, and they the effect. America, for example, you see that ex poverty didn't reduce because even those countries with huge increase. Look at Congo, some back again the topic of infrastructure because that is what creates development. to all the unconnected in digital technology. Look at the magnitudes for Africa. 139 billion dollars. Yes, remember that your numbers and remember the recovery plans of Italy. Remember the recovery plans of the US, okay? This will put everybody connected to broadband in Africa. And we know it has a huge impact and digital technologies are playing a crucial role. So again, we need to be efficient. We need to be smart in how we allocate resources. Second element, which is central on this process is some waste. Reduction of food loss and waste, improve food security and nutrition, improve productivity, reduce the use of natural resources. Why we cannot reduce this 14% and this 70% of waste? We know we will have a triple win. And remember, people say, okay, if I reduce losses, there will be more supply, farmers will get lower prices. Yes and no. Because if there is more demand for high value commodities because of healthy diets, there will be a demand pressure. But second, losses are not only physical total losses, it's also the quality losses. And if I improve the access to quality, I won't have more produce in the market. I will have produce in the market with better quality. So, I, so it's very important to take and to bring a big change in this respect. One topic that also is extremely important is what is happening today, horizontal farming, which is mostly for vegetables, which are the commodities which are moving less in the trade market even before. Now people say, let's move local. Let's forget global value. That's a mistake. The only commodity that you can really move local vegetables, that's what moves the less. But if you want to have access to fruits and meats and so on, the staples, you need to be global. But if vegetables, they are... They they could be moving closer to cities. Why? Because horizontal farming has shown to be successful. Vertical farming still is not too cost effective, but it's moving, it's progressing. But then you have this process of automatization and robotics, which have accelerated enormously, not only in developed countries, but also in developing countries. 
What this means, it means that we need to create an automatization which is scale neutral, because if not, all the small holders will be excluded. And that's why I put these little robots inside, because those robots are very little, are very flexible, and they can work in small farms. They can do soil testing. They can do precision farming. People talk about precision farming. Precision farming is happening today for large farmers. But the ideal is that we want precision farming for the smallholders because they are the ones that have the biggest budget constraint. We want them to be as efficient as possible. So how we can convert this automatization to be scale neutral? But this will create a change in jobs. And that's the graph in the right hand side. The remaining employment in all sectors will be affected. And there will be a loss in employment in the old sectors. And then we need to create new employment. And today, when we have such a labor supply of the youth in Africa, for example, if we don't build of building capacities, we will have a terrible mismatch between the labor demand, what the companies will request in this automatization, and what the labor supply, the people looking for work, can supply. We cannot afford that mismatch. And we need to triple the efforts and accelerate the efforts in human capital development and creating the skills. If not, all these people will be suffering more, inequalities will be bigger. So this is the, the situation we are facing. And where is the way forward, at least in my impression? How economic growth is shaped directly affect the levels for both poverty and inequality. For this reason, understanding how poverty, inequality, and agri-food systems interact is of key importance. We won't have a green recovery if we don't look at the agricultural sector and the rural areas. Within the agri-food systems, agriculture plays a fundamental role for poverty reduction with evidence from several countries and regions showing the superior role of agricultural growth versus other sectors for poverty reduction, particularly within the poorest populations and low-income countries. So we know agriculture can give the returns we need. However, agricultural growth is not always inclusive of the poor and vulnerable. As the complexity and global outreach of agri-food systems increases, small scale and poor producers face new opportunities in urban, international, and quality demanding food markets. At the same time, they face important challenges as these markets demand higher quality standards and greater resources and capacities. Risk adverse policies can have irreversible impacts on the poorest of the poor and the most vulnerable and rather increase levels of poverty and inequality. It is therefore important to be risk prepared and mindful of the, our actions can severely affect most vulnerable populations, which are always at the forefront of the biggest loss. Agri-food systems will play an important role in reaching SDG 1, 2, and 10. There is no way we will achieve them if we don't include the agri-food systems. As recognized by the Food Systems Summit, which includes advanced in equitable livelihoods and equitable value distribution, and one of the five action tracks. A system approach allows to simultaneously address the three fundamental agendas of food system transformation, food security and nutrition, eradication of poverty and strengthening livelihoods, and the sustainable management of natural resources. Agri-food system transformation, we have to embed a specific action in this process to enable the poor, both producers and consumers, to participate and benefit as equal actors and active partners. Policies should address the structural constraints faced by the poor agricultural households by increasing their access to natural resources and other assets, improve their capacity to manage risk and increase their productivity, and link small-scale agriculture to markets and agri-food systems, create decent enough farm employment for the poor in agriculture and the rural non-farm economy, including by fostering entrepreneurship and providing occupational skills, build and scale up social protection systems, build rural infrastructure, especially energy, transport, water, and sanitation, build human capital, in particular to basic social services, such as health and education, and strengthen rural institutions and local governments to foster their participation in a policy dialogue and decision-making. Empowering the rural poor to increase political participation is central as a way for them to benefit from the development process. Let me just finalize, dear colleagues, by saying that COVID pandemic provides us with an astonishing wake-up call on the fragility of our agri-food system. But it also provides us the opportunity to reevaluate how we tackle the root causes of our hunger and build resilience against threats to start new before it is too late and we are hit with other global disaster at the same or greater magnitude. The pause requires that we look frankly and honestly. Let science speak first, not only at the facts on hunger, but also at the drivers behind the trends and inequalities in access to food that lie at the heart of the problem. 
It requires that we understand the interconnected nature of the factors driving food insecurity and the shortcomings of our food systems. Thank you. Thank you so much. And sorry if I went a few minutes further. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Mr. Torero, for this uh, say wonderful journey and analysis uh, uh, about the community of uh, food systems. Uh, well, to summarize your, your uh, uh, speech, I think that some of the keywords that you have touched and are particularly important are holistic approaches, inequalities and inclusion, community and complexity. And uh, I believe that uh, you emphasize that the attention on sustainability and the needs uh, for, let's say, better metrics and better methods to address uh, su sustainability. And if we want to uh, advance with uh, approaches that allow us to have an holistic understanding of the food system, we need to start from science and from uh, the development of uh, a systematic and uh, sustainability uh, assessment framework that allow us to a better understanding of the different pillars of sustainability and a better understanding of the complexity of the food system. And uh, in, let's say, emphasizing the complexity, some of the key elements that you have uh, underlined are the trade-offs between natural resources and poverty eradication. So between the use of natural resources, so environmental impacts uh, and communities. Uh, so on, on one side, uh, there is uh, a growing attention on uh, environment and environmental issues. On the other side, the term community uh, is something that is probably still a little bit too uh, outside of the understanding of our food system and that we should include more often in, uh, let's say, policy making and also in, uh, in analysis since food systems are generally aimed to feed communities and need to be designed for and together with the communities. And uh, I think that in, uh, let's say, shaping uh, these challenges, you have emphasized uh, multiple challenges from food security, healthy diets, obesity, uh, obesity and uh, food-related diseases, uh, food losses and waste, uh, uh, environmental externalities, inequalities. And we are facing these uh, challenges, uh, let's say, uh, in many different ways. And all the stakeholders, all the actors of the food supply chain are facing these challenges from uh, governments to producers and entrepreneurs, but also consumers. We have, uh, uh, when we make food related uh, uh, decisions, we are uh, taking decisions uh, that are responding to, let's say, competing goals in terms of uh, uh, choosing, uh, let's say, healthy food uh, or decreasing uh, uh, food waste uh, or improving uh, uh, environmental conditions. And uh, we take these kind of challenges uh, in rural areas as well in uh, cities uh, uh, that are another important, uh, let's say, setting where food consumption but also production uh, is uh, a key challenge. So uh, a question or, uh, let's say, a further uh, element of analysis is probably related to policies and to what policies might help to, let's say, understand uh, and uh, ad address this uh, complexity. I believe that until now, agri-food policies have been often uh, quite sectorial, so often designed in silos, while you were clearly emphasizing the need for policies that were looking at different uh, challenges and, and uh, policy areas from uh, uh, agri-food, but also environment, logistics, social inclusion. And uh, sometimes uh, agricultural and food policies are disconnected and other times are even uh, not coherent, not consistent, uh, consistent in terms of, uh, uh, of goals. So uh, I believe that if we want to promote uh, a holistic approach to the food system, we probably require also a change or a transition or a transformation in terms of uh, policy uh, approaches from uh, sectorial uh, approaches uh, to more integrated type uh, of agricultural and food policies. And uh, if this, uh, let's say, type of transition uh, is needed, uh, my question would be how you would define an integrated agricultural and food policy? What 
you would identify as the pillars of an integrated agricultural and food policy? And what concrete actions a government should take in order to promote and support this, this transformation? So in order to make this transformation happening. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for that beautiful uh, drawing. Uh, it really impressed me how, how you capture everything I was, I was saying. Uh, regarding your, your question, I, I think uh, the, the most important thing here is to understand that uh, rural sector and, and rural areas is a continuum. I, I, I did an exercise of, of looking at all the countries and how they define rural areas. And you will be surprised. The definition of what is rural is very different across different countries. No? In some countries, it's a amount of people, and other countries, it's access to certain types of infrastructure. In others, are completely political definitions, like in China, for example. Uh, so when we talk about rural, people are not talking about the same thing. We just use a dummy variable, rural urban. But that rural urban dummy has a very different meaning. So for us, it's a continuum, rural urban, OK? And that's where we need to understand the integrated approach, as you were mentioning. This is not a one sector. This cannot be the Ministry of Agriculture. That's for I believe that when we talk about uh, we need to spend 10% of, of, of the GDP in agriculture ministry and public investment in agriculture, it's not the correct to way to go. We need to increase investment in the food system, in the agri-food system, as I mentioned before, and that goes across sectors. It is related to energy, it is related to infrastructure, it is related to health, it is related to economic activity. Why I'm saying this? Because if I, for example, shift towards healthy diets, I will reduce and CDs, non-communicable diseases, for sure. And that's a future effect, no? That if you don't reduce NCDs in 10 or 15 years, your social security will have to pay for it. Now bring that trillions of dollars to the present value. And that will help the Ministry of Finance today to make an optimal decision why we need to improve access to health. And therefore, why I will need to put more money or transfer subsidies to support more of this. At the same time, we know that shifting to healthy diets, which by the way, uh, vegetarian diets are not healthy diets. We because they miss uh, certain vitamins. Healthy diets are the ones that give you I think we're having, Mr. Turner is having some connection problems. I don't know if it's just me. I, I don't think so. No, so. he's freezed at the moment. Yes. Also for me. Yeah. Okay. So in the meantime, I would like to thank Silvia Bacanti for this amazing drawing, uh, for uh, which is our scraper. So thank you so much, Silvia, for summarizing this beautiful conference. I believe we have we have lost him now. Yes, yes, he lost connection. So let's just wait a couple of minutes. Okay, no, he's, he's coming back. He's back. Yeah. But we can't hear you, Dr. Torero. I don't know up to where you heard, but I was talking of healthy diets. Did you hear that part? Yeah. Until okay. healthy so, diets so, and uh, yeah. Okay, so what I was trying to say is that you create NCDs and you bring the the, the saving of those non-communicable diseases to the present, and that's a benefit, the same with emissions. Okay, the, the point is that first, it has to be a multi-sectoral approach. It has to be across different sectors. Second, I think the incentive needs to be properly aligned. Today, incentives are not aligned. And as I mentioned before, subsidies have to be rethought, okay? And countries need to think differently in terms of the subsidies. The third thing is we need to start taking into account the whole value of, of food, the real cost of food. We don't measure externalities. When I move a commodity from one location to the other, I'm moving water. I'm moving certain natural resources. I'm creating emissions. Those externalities need to be measured. We call it um, uh, trade-offs, and we are doing an effort to do that. But then we need to assign a price to it so that we understand what this implies. Fourth, I think it's essential that we keep increasing access to trade. That does not mean that access to trade has to go against producing vegetables closer to cities. They have to complement. But it's the only way we can allocate resources in the most efficient way. And access to trade should include the issue of greenhouse gas emissions. 
it doesn't make any sense today in the way the, 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 the Kyoto Protocol is working because the Kyoto Protocol allow you initially to trade emissions, but because of a, an inefficient system and an inefficient institutional design, it didn't work. But it doesn't make any sense that I have a country like New Zealand, which produces cattle in the most efficient way in terms of emissions, to reduce the production of cattle, somebody else will produce a country in Africa, which will increase more emissions because they, are, they don't have the technology. So if we were able to trade emissions, we will create a better situation. New Zealand should continue to produce cattle. The other country that doesn't have the technology should produce something else. Okay, but it's the worst to say we will reduce the production of meat in New Zealand to meet with the with the with the cup that I committed to the COP, while the other country will have because Africa needs still those proteins. We need access to those resources and available. So we need to be clear on that. I think the other element which is central is that we need to understand what is a public good and what is a private good. We normally confuse the concepts a lot. Emissions will affect the public good of environment, of climate. So it's a global public good, it's not a private good, okay? Water, soil, and so on is, is private goods. And finally, I think uh, we need to have targeting and cost-effective interventions. The, the reason why I showed the graph of the, of the marginal cost curve, uh, abatement cost curve, to, is to show which interventions really pay off. And normally when we are in crisis like the one we are, is we rush into decisions to allocate money with the best of the intentions, but not using and targeting them properly. I don't have it here, but if I can show you a map uh, of what is the situation of the traditional hotspots in certain countries in Africa, for example, of food insecurity before COVID-19, and I show you the same map of which are the new hotspots of food insecurity, there is a significant mismatch. But most of the money is going to the traditional because of lack of real-time information to show people that they have to change because there are other new hotspots that are appearing which are different to the traditional ones. Just take the example of India. What is happening in India today is not a correlate to what it was before. So if I use my traditional cash transfers to resolve the problem, I will be targeting areas which are not the areas where the major problems are right now. So again, we need to better target and better put in place cost-effective policies. And, and that requires having information on time identifying those best practices and seriously linking these recovery plans to solutions that will structurally change the way we, we, we operate. And finally, institutions. They are central and they are difficult. If I want to re regulate the digital world, for example, digital technologies and telecommunications, we know that regulatory agencies at the country level could be easily captured. So for Africa, the best will be to do something like Europe, having regional regulatory agencies, the strong ones, that will help to accelerate competition. And human capital also is central for this. We need to accelerate enormously capabilities of the human capital. So sorry if I extended too much, but those are more or less the areas where I think we need to operate to be able to minimize these inequalities that we are facing today. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Torero. And I leave uh, the floor to Eleonora since she is col uh, collecting the questions for moment. Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, let's just wait for the slider platform to charge and then we'll ask you. We have many questions, so I don't think we're going to have time for all of them, but uh, let's just, okay, here they are. So I'm just going to begin with the first one, the most voted one. So how can we better reconcile private corporate interests and wider societal development and sustainability? Okay, so I think that's a very important question. Uh, and I think the way to do it is, is to, the public sector is supposed to enable the environment. And the private sector is supposed also to regulate the, the way in which we, we operate. Uh, that requires uh, that the private sector will have to follow certain rules of the game. And that's where uh, they have to assume the sustainability issues. So if a, a private company wants to come to operate into, into agriculture uh, and wants to do certain activities, they have to comply with certain principles put in place. Like we have responsible investment uh, principles in place that has been approved and, and there are guidelines attached to it. So again, that, that's the way that you will create. But the most important thing is to have incentives clear. No? It's perfectly okay that a company makes money, but at the same time, it's perfectly okay that the company recognize 
the cost over the environment. One very nice example in agriculture, linked to agriculture, is mining, for example. If you go to Canada, which is one of the most progressive countries in terms of how to handle mines, mining is a natural resource extraction industry, like agriculture. It goes, extracts the mineral, and damages the environment. Now, normally, when you do that in, in, in Canada, you have to first develop a plan which has a whole life cycle of the mine, which includes from the extraction to the recovery of the site. So that's, those are the rules that we need to place in agriculture. If I am going to have investment in land, I am going to deteriorate the soil, I'm going to extract water, I have to have the full cycle and I have to recover what I use. And that's part of the job. And that's part of the cost that the private sector also has to incorporate in the decision process. That is for me to have the correct incentives in place. Thank you so much, Dr. Torero, and thank you, Faith, for this question. So let's move on to the next question uh, by Laura Andres. How can governments support women who often produce a big percentage of a country's food but don't owe the land, thus becoming unpaid laborers? Yeah, that's completely correct, uh, especially now in COVID-19, the sectors which are affected mostly in the agri-industry, in the agri-food system, are processing, packaging, uh, and uh, transportation. And those are sectors which normally are handled most by women. Therefore, inequalities are increasing. Now, why by women? Because fingers. Uh, when you do packaging, you need to pick up the problems, and women have thing and smaller fingers, which allow them to do that. Now, what we need to do, especially in the terms of land, is uh, joint ownership. Uh, Latin America has progressed a lot on that, on titles of property which are joint. Now, in Africa, for example, the land is given in concession, so it's very difficult to do that, and, and the reform of land will be complex. But what we can do is work with the corporate sector so that when they purchase from the farmer, it's not only the male, it's also the female, depending on the share of how they produce. So we need to find innovative ways to do that. Now, empowering women is not just an issue that you have more power. To be able to realize the new empowerment, you need to have money, you need to have access to assets, you need to have income. And that's why we need to change these rights and access so that women can have access to finance and can make better decisions, okay? And one part of that, which normally we don't talk too much, is wage gaps. And in agriculture, a woman that is working in the packaging industry with the same skills than a male will earn less. And those are the things that the government has to play a role. We need to equal wage gaps. So a lot of reforms can happen and we need to do them smartly, but we really need to effectively empower women, not just say, we have more power in decision making. You won't have more power if you don't have access to assets and access to income. Thank you so much. And thank you, Laura, for your question. And let's move on to Ingrid Salvatori, who is asking, how will food security cope with population's growth? It is estimated that in 2050, there will be uh, 9.8 billion people and an increased lack of food resources. Yeah, so look, if I project the availability of food by 2030 or by 2050, we have enough food available in terms of calories. If we look even to the nutritious food that we will need and the macronutrients, we will have enough food availability. And even despite that we still have enormous gaps of productivity and yields that we can increase. So I don't see a problem on food uh, availability. I see a problem on food access which we are facing today too. And food access means people having more income. So I think the only way we will achieve that and have people access to more healthy diets is by reducing inequalities. That's the only way. That's a better distribution of access to assets. That's more income generation activities, farm or non-farm, so that people can have more access to food. Now, the other constraint is the environment. And for that, we need to account externalities. We need to account trade-offs. And we need to find a way to compensate those. We will be able to have the food available, but we need to be careful that we have a restriction in the limits of the nature. And we need to be careful that we have to produce more, be more efficient with less access to resources. Possible it is, but we need to start doing it now. I see. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Torero. So let's move on to the last questions, unfortunately, because we're running out of time. Um, so uh, an anonymous is asking why vegetarian and vegan diets are not helping in your opinion. Are they sustainable, though? No, it's not that it's my opinion. It's, it's technically the definition of healthy diets is that you have to have all the micronutrients com com complaint, uh, components and vegetarian diets don't have all the micronutrients. That's why you, you take supplements. 
but that does not mean that they are bad. Of course, you can do it, but you will need to take vitamin supplements like B16 and so on. If they had all the different macronutrients that you need, then we can call them healthy diets. Healthy diets is a diversity of diets. It is, you have to have different types of food so that you can have all the macronutrients. Uh, now, uh, they are, they are, sustainability has three elements, no? so we need to be careful. But if we are referring to environmental sustainability, not necessarily is the case. Okay. Uh, certain uh, diets are more environmentally sustainable than others. Uh, vegetarian, of course, you are not eating meat, therefore you are reducing one of the major components of emissions. But as I show in my, in my decomposition of emissions, uh, meat is one proportion of it. The value chain is another proportion and the transportation and so on and so forth. So we need to take all into, into consideration. So again, it is not my opinion, it's technically what it means. And only on the unrealistic 2030 objectives, uh, yes, they are aspirational, okay? But what I'm trying to say is we can at least be on track and on path. It could be we don't do it in 2030, we can do it in 2040, but we need to have aspirations. And that's the aim of, of this. Thank you so much for this very interesting conference and for all those answers. And now we, we are running, we run out of time for this conference. So uh, we are going to direct you to the meet the speaker. And I wish you thank you once more and thank you Professor Vitwari for your help and your expertise. I hope the participants enjoy the conference. And um, yeah, just uh, thank you again for this great opportunity. Oh, thank, you. thank you very much, it was a real pleasure. And thank you for that nice drawing. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Silvia. Thank you, goodbye. Bye-bye Professor. Bye-bye.